Right then. Nonsense, you've given me what? Six minutes? <laughs> Seven minutes. Right. Quickly, quickly. Do, do, quick. out of time. Right. Stars. How do stars work? <laughs> that's that's my quick finale. How do stars work? What well, we look at stars all the time and all the things that have to do with them, but how do they actually work? What is going on? Well, for most of human history, we have no idea what they made of. In fact, even the back of the Georgians is how people think stars work is usually reflected in the, their science material and engineering at the time. So the Greeks thought it was like lava and volcanoes and things like that. Um, the Georgians thought it possibly a big ball of coal that was on fire. Um, to point out that you know, that mass of coal would you know, burn up pretty quickly. It wouldn't last that long. Um, and so it's, it's really not until we get through to the Victorians um, and into the 20th century where we start to work out what's going on. It's not until we basically discover the atom um, and how at the beginning of atomic and quantum physics that we actually work out how these things work. Um, so it all starts with this man here who is... I don't know why I bother. <laughs> Arthur Eddington. This is Arthur Eddington. Um, and Arthur Eddington was an astronomer at the beginning of the 20th century, a uh, British astronomer, and he is uh, the person who basically puts the, the first work into um, kind of how stars actually work. And he, he's said to be the first person who understood relativity. It, it was sort of, it, when, when asked, when someone asked, you know, do you, do you understand relativity? They said, no, I don't, but, you know, Einstein does, clearly, and Arthur Eddington does. And he was, he was it. Um, he um, put together a, a paper called The Internal Constitution of Stars. And in it, he, he goes through sort of his conjecture and reasons of why he thinks stars work in a certain way based on things like relativity. Of course, E equals MC squared. He, he figured that what that revealed was that, well, energy and mass. So it must be that, that this energy, this amount of energy coming from a star must be to do with a conversion of mass into energy. So that, that was kind of his first big conjecture. And he, um, up until then, he... he the, the, the kind of the leading theory was the contraction theory that stars kind of were, were contracting under gravity and that contraction was, was providing the energy and, and that was what was making them shine and, and do the thing that the, this, this movement was uh, the pressure created by gravity was doing that that's part of the answer but it, it's not enough energy and that's what Alfred says like, this doesn't work this, is, this, this must be part of the answer but it doesn't work and he says well perhaps the contraction squashes hydrogen into helium and that's where the energy is actually coming from but there has to be he's the first person to sort of say well this radiation pressure must be pushing back against gravity and it's actually those two things interacting with each other that is providing the energy and he's the first person to point that out um, and francis ashton um who's the sort of chemist had pointed out that hydrogen um and helium there was the sort of 0.8% mass difference between a helium and four hydrogens. And he, he, so Eddington went, well, that, there's our answer. That 0.8% that of missing mass must be the energy. That's why stars are working. Um, and so he works out that uh, for something like the sun, it would need about 5% of it to be fusible hydrogen. And that would be enough. Because of course, the sun's a huge ball of hydrogen, but actually, all, the, all the, the action is happening just in the core. Now that's, that's just denser in the core, but not a huge amount. In fact, most of the sun, if you took a cup full of the sun, it's less dense than the juices and gases in your stomach. Which is a nice sort of thought. Yeah. But actually, the sun is not that dense. It's, it's really quite tense. In fact, if you've done any white light solar astronomy, what do you get around the edge? Yeah, limb darkening. What's limb darkening? So you've all seen it, and you're thinking, what is it? You're looking through the sun. You're literally seeing the darkness of space behind the sun in that outer part of the, of the photosphere. It's that tenuous, you actually can see through it, essentially. So the sun isn't that dense, so it actually requires about 5%. And he, he was the first person <coughs> to work that out. Um, and so he then suggested, as, as kind of the answer, he's like, well, I think this is how they work. This is before anyone had even proved that hydrogen could be converted into helium. 
Um, and he said, well, I think this is how it worked. And I also would suggest, this is where all the other elements come from. That actually, if that works, why can't we just squash atoms into bigger things as we go through? So he was a genius and one of those, one of those people who's sort of brilliant. Um, he was also a pacifist, refused to fight in World War One, um, and then tried to bring kind of the two countries back together again in 1919 by proving relativity as a, as a British scientist, then proving a German scientist theory. Anyway, um, it moves on, and it's these four people here who really um, sort of nail it, and um, these four write the most cited paper in physics. Uh, and it's, it's called the um, B2FH paper, because it's named after the, the four people there. These two are married, so they're B2, um, uh, the Burbages. Uh, and then you've got, is that the quiz, quiz answer yesterday? Hoyle. Yes, Fred Hoyle. And then you've got uh, William, I always get his Fowler, I always get his wrong name wrong, William Fowler. He is from Caltech. Um, they were from Cambridge, and they're the ones who bring this paper together to say, actually, this is how stars work. This is this Eddington's right, and various other people are right. Beth, the German um, scientist, he uh, in 1939 had, had put forward the idea of what we're going to look at in a second, the PP chain, the proton-proton chain. Which he said how the sun works, and then he worked later on to say that I think there's a cycle for bigger stars called the CNO cycle, which is this carbon, nitrogen, oxygen cycle. And that's it. And these guys kind of take that, take <coughs> all the evidence, actually go and take the data from various stars and the sun, put it all together into this paper, and basically prove that this is how stars work. And it's the most cited paper, it was 1956, most cited paper in physics, um, I think it's um, And up until then, the, the kind of leading theory had moved on a bit, because Eddington had, had done that, and people were like, yeah, maybe Eddington's right. But the big element thing was Gamo had said that actually, the, actually all the elements probably created in the Big Bang. There was enough energy and things like that. Big Bang had happened, you know, the, the kind of theory had appeared. And so up until the 40s, that was the leading theory now for all elements, that it was the Big Bang that did it. Um, these are the guys who said, no, it isn't. In fact, it was Fred Hoyle actually kind of, well, this is disputed whether he led the group, but he had come up with the original idea in 1946, and the others then were kind of students of his and things like that, and worked with him. But they, they sort of argue about who was lead on the paper. Um, but it was 1946 when he said, ah, do you know what, I don't think it is. I think Eddington's got the key, and that, that's how it works. So, how does it work? Well. This is the PP chain. Um, so, in simple terms, you get four hydrogens. Ta -da! And, you, and under, under the pressure of gravity in the core, where it's 15 million degrees, you squeeze them together. And, and I'll pop the positron, bing, bing, and neutrinos. Now, of course, neutrinos, we know this is true. We know this is what we've, we've now physically proved this, because, of course, neutrinos are where? Where are they right now? Everywhere. Yeah, passing through your body by the billions right now, streaming through the sun, uh, from the sun, through the atmosphere, through Earth, they can go through Earth, they don't interact with you, streaming through. Then, of course, you end up with a sort of heavier version of hydrogen. You ram it together another bit of hydrogen, you get a gamma ray, we detect gamma rays from the sun in the quantities that we would expect. Um, and then, of course, you've got helium-3, ram that together, Two of them ping off to become back to normal hydrogen, and then you end up with a helium at the bottom. And in that, that energy release each time, of course, is also released light. That is what is coming off of the sun. That's why the sun glows. That, that's the basic principle of this chain. Um, and that was what they, they showed, and we, we can now prove this. We can now detect the neutrinos, we can detect the gamma rays, we, we can now show this. And the amount of light coming off, it, it, it's, it's now. This is how it works. Um, the CNO cycle is much more complicated. I wasn't going to show you that because it's just it's really, really complicated. But it, it's the basic principle. It's supposed to be Astronomy 101. Um, so it's, it's the same kind of idea that we go through this using heavier elements like carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, and you go through this cycle um, and the different elements sort of come out. And if you look at sort of big stars, as they get towards their, their point where they're dying, that's where they've gone. They're like onions. And so it all happens in the centre. 
And as it runs out of each element, what happens, of course, is that pressure that Eddington realised was, was important, that radiation, the radioactive pressure coming out from the centre that keeps it like a balloon inflated. Um, it stops, or lowers, and of course gravity then starts to win, so the star contracts. But that increases the pressure and the temperature inside, so then the next cycle can sort of start and kick starts. And then that runs out, and so the pressure reduces, but the star contracts more, and, and this is that process, but it leaves all these shells behind. So these are all the kind of previous burnings going on, until we get to iron. Of course, iron, it, it's, it's like an energy trough, basically. And the amount of energy you've got to put in to then take it further, it stops. Iron's at the bottom of this trough. You can't, you need so much more energy to move it on until the star dies. In fact, we think stars make iron literally in their last day. So a big star makes iron in that last kind of 24 hours of its life, and then its core just basically locks up. Can't do anything. And so all that radiation pressure stops, and suddenly, it, gravity completely wins, collapses the star, everything's rammed together, bang, it rebounds, that's a supernova in sort of simple terms. And it's in that instant where they get those extreme temperatures and pressures that loads of the other elements are made. And so I, I love the idea that, you know, like the iron in your blood made in the dying moments of a star's life. It's just great. That's a great idea, isn't it? Um, but even all those like precious metals like gold and things like that, you know, made in the instant of supernova. Just a kind of really romantic notion. Um, and of course, it, you know, it comes from this. This. This is this is how we you know think the the universe works. Basically, it's this system of kind of stars being formed in the nebulae, and they go through that. So you know, something like the sun will go through this process, become a red giant, um, and make a planetary nebula, and that will seed stuff, and then it will. Be recycled, things will be recycled, and then big mass stars go through that burning of the CNO cycle and things, and will explode and put loads of stuff out, and it's just this constant recycling. So you realize that you know, the atoms in your body have probably been through a couple of stars through the history of the universe, which is again really cool. You know, all these these things are, are made in stars. Um, this is this is the current thinking of where the elements are made. Um, so you've got hydrogen, helium, a little bit of lithium, of course, big bang. Uh, you've got the green stuff is sun-like stars have made it, yellow stuff is massive stars, and then you've got other other things going on, so like neutron collisions and things like that, white dwarfs exploding, that other type of supernova, uh, cosmic rays coming from stars, things like that, the effect of clouds of, of dust and gas and things like that, and things. And you see, this is, this is kind of how we think it works. So you see, mostly, actually, a lot of it's you know, low-mass stars. Um, and I love the fact we're such clever monkeys, but we've made our own ones because we can go better. <laughs> That's it. Like we've, we've worked this out so well, we can do it ourselves now. Um, and that is the end. There we go. Nice. Awesome. <laughs> Questions? Both of them. Go for it. Oh, yeah, it's been watched all the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's being. Well, it won't. Yeah, you won't see the iron. Yeah, because it won't get dragged up. Yeah. It's right. like one day that the iron. And it's falls. deep in the core. Yeah. And it's already massive. I mean, Betelgeuse, if you put it in the middle of the solar system, the Earth, Mars would be inside it. it it'd be almost out to. That's probably out to that Jupiter by now. So it's a huge. But of course, that means the core is deep, you know, it's like the size of the sun inside this massive envelope of tenuous gas that's holding on to be a star but it's huge so we, we'll see it when it explodes but i doubt we will because it's probably hundreds of thousands of years in the yes. future yeah the first sign we'll get is a, a massive rush of neutrinos mm. well that'll be the first sign because the neutrinos when the star collapses they can just pass through you know they're not impeded by matter uh and then it'll be a few hours later is when we'll yeah, start to see it brighten. Minimum about 15 minute warning, isn't it? It's like the yeah. kind of, they think it's, it's yeah. like the, the, the smallest amount of warning we'll get. There's a massive, all the neutrino detectors will go ping. 
Yeah. And all the hopefully all the, the scopes will slew in that direction, and we'll see it. It's bound to be in the southern hemisphere. But it'll be, you know, yeah. it'll, no, it'll, it'll be, happen. It'll Cloudy. Be the no, it'll be, it'll be, yeah, it'll be in the summer when it's yeah. behind the sun. Yeah. <laughs> so, inevitably. Like, yeah. It's like when I was um, observing down in South Africa, we had little gravitational wave alarms. Yeah. So if there was a gravitational wave detected and it was observable to our telescope, literally we had an iPad. It was like being in MI5 that would send us a coordinate. We had to stop what we were doing, move the telescope to that coordinate. And there was like a little police alarm that would like flash and go off. It was ridiculous. But there'll be a similar setup. So like, yeah, if the neutrino detectors get this like whack of neutrinos yeah. from the right direction, every telescope would be straight onto it. My favourite one of those warnings was just a couple of years ago, and it was, uh, it was South African Teleco again, and they they put out they had seen a big bright thing in the sky, so put out this this flash warning to all the scopes in the world, slew to this direction. We think we've seen a, a thing, it's a supernova or something like that, and that went out. So imagine around the world, all these like, and everyone's yeah. slewing their telescopes, and then about ten minutes later, another one came again. No, sorry, it's Mars. <laughs> <laughs> We're typical professional astronomers have yeah. looked in the sky and gone, there's a really bright thing in the sky! Oh, it's Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, oh, over there. All the planetary nebulas are very different. I know that some of them look different because of our perspective. Yeah. But can you tell anything about the star from its from the look at that planetary nebula? Mm, interesting, yeah. It's, um, so their structure can tell us a little bit like how about how they were dying. So, you know, the layers that they were puffing off, for example. Because like you say, a lot of how Paji Nebli look is depends on their orientation. Um, oh God, my voice is really going now, isn't it? <laughs> I thought you were getting emotional about no, the dying. Oh God, dying stars, yeah. M57, let's have a moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so um, it can tell us kind of about the internal gubbins of what's happening to these stars as they're dying, because, you know, as they're pepping off the different layers, you can see that. Um, but rather than, because all the stars that produce plants, you know, are largely similar. You know, all stars have a very similar composition. It's just a case of uh, how, how massive they are, you know, in terms of the heavier elements that are within them. It varies uh, very little, um, just like... They're all going to be subtly different because yeah. there, there isn't a sort of mould that a star yeah. is made in. So while, you know, there'll be a sun-like star, it'll be a slightly different mass, <laughs> slightly smaller, slightly bigger, might have a slightly different of the metal content from the cloud it forms. So, yeah, the planetary nebula will reveal some of the like oh there's slightly more of this element than that element yeah. and things like that. It's, they, they do that's and those colours, those colours are often some it's just pretty pretty imaging people putting in pretty pictures on. But some of it is because you know, this this is oxygen, this is not you know yeah. different elements and you can see that some of them are different from that. But yeah. they're also really similar. Yeah. You know, some subtlety. Yeah. Good question. Really?